Banna. Hello, my friends. That was hello in Shoshone. The reason why we're saying hello in Shoshone today is because we are starting our next book called Nayanuki, The Girl Who Ran by Kenneth Tomasa. Tomasa. Now, in this book, you're going to be listening to it and then answering questions at the end. So it's very important that you pay attention to the story so that you can answer the questions at the end. All right, let's get started with Naya Nuki, The Girl Who Ran. On the move, a great bald eagle circled high overhead against the clear blue sky. On a mountainside, a small band of Indians moved slowly over a ridge and down into a beautiful valley. Below the soaring eagle and near the end of the slow moving line of Indians walked two 11 year old Indian girls dressed in loose fitting deerskin dresses. The girl's long black hair hung down to their waists. From the day that they were born, the two Shoshone girls had been on the move, always in search of food. Many days there was not enough to eat. Many nights the girls went to sleep hungry. Even now, as they were hungry, they spent many hours each day gathering roots and berries, but there never seemed to be enough. Indian hunters went out every day to search for elk, deer, and other game. When they returned with meat, it was quickly eaten, and usually there was little to save for the next day's meal. Now the small band followed a faint Indian road that was no more than a wide trail. They were just coming out of the Lemhi Valley in Idaho when the western Mount Montana. In 1801, however, there were no states of Idaho or Montana. In fact, no white man had ever been in this mountain land. The Shoshone Indians had only heard stories of the Tabone, Tababone, which is white man, whose skin was a pale color. The Indians knew only the seasons and not that the year was 1801 by the white man's counting. These two Indian girls talked quietly as they followed their people. They were frightened. They knew that each step they took moved them closer to the prairie and the closer to danger of attack by fierce tribes, such as the Crow, the Blackfoot, and the Minotaurs. 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 These warlike tribes came to steal Shoshone horses, to kill Shoshone warriors, and to take their women and children prisoner. The Shoshone Indians had to go to their prairie to hunt buffalo. They needed meat for food, hides for clothing and shelter, and bones for tools. Without dried buffalo meat for the long winter, many of the tribe would starve to death. The Shoshones must risk their chance of attack. They must have buffalo. The Shoshones had many fine horses, but did not have rifles. The skillful hunters could ride swiftly among the stampeding buffalo and shoot arrow after arrow into the giant beast until it dropped to the earth to die. The hunt was exciting and dangerous, but one buffalo could mean hundreds of pounds of meat and a large hide for making robes and moccasins. Sacagawea and Nyanuki knew that horses helped their hunters to kill the wild animals. I sometimes wish we did not have horses, whispered Nyanuki. Then maybe the fierce tribes from the prairie would not come to steal and kill. They would still come, replied Sacagawea. They would still kill and take prisoners. Then I wish the buffalo would come to the, our home valley so that we could would not have to make this dangerous journey away from our mountains. I have great fear we shall be attacked, said Nyanuki. It was a warm, sunny afternoon. Billowing white clouds drifted across the sky. Nyanuki and Sacagawea were tall, thin, 11-year-old girls with lots of energy. But after a long day of walking behind the Indian men, mounted on horses, both girls were tired and hungry. Nyanuki needed only a little time for rest and some much-needed food and a surge of energy came back to her. She was one of the strongest of the children in the village. She could run faster and further than any boy or girl, even those older than she. Nyanuki loved to be moving, each day seeing familiar sights that she remembered from other trips over these same Indian roads. Water in the high mountain streams was clear and cold. Wildflowers filled the meadows, and the sky seemed bluer than ever. When the men decided to stop, they picked a dry, level spot, camp, spot to camp. It was surrounded by willow bushes and near a fast-moving stream. 
It was chosen because it was well hidden from view, with plenty of firewood and good water nearby. Right away, Sacagawea and Nyanuki began their task of helping to build shelters for their band. Trimmed sticks were used to make the frame of, for small shelters. Woven mats and some animal hides were used for a covering. In less than an hour, the shelters were up and would protect them from the wind and keep out the rain, if it should come. After the shelters were built, the girls and the women gathered firewood, picked berries, and dug roots. Every member of the village had work to do to make survival possible. A village only had only 30 to 40 members. There were just enough to protect each other and still be a small enough group to move quickly in case of danger. This summer had been a hard one for all Indians. Big game animals were scarce. Very little rain had fallen and seeds were hard to find. Nyanuki and Sacagawea had that familiar feeling of an empty stomach, but it was not usually this bad until late winter, when food supplies always ran low. Nyanuki and Sacagawea were searching for roots after their shelters were built. I hope we have a good hunt for the great buffalo, said Sacagawea. I could not eat I could eat a whole buffalo liver. I'm so hungry, answered Nyanuki. I'll take the heart and the tongue. We will eat these parts without cooking them. They taste good without cooking, and cooking takes too long, said Sacagawea. Hungry Indians often ate the tender parts of the buffalo raw. Leftover meat would be cut into thin strips and laid in the sun to dry. The dried meat would not spoil and could be used during the winter. Seeds were gathered all summer and fall. They were, ground to they were ground to make a flour that could be formed into small cakes. Roots were dug, mashed, and dried. Snares were set to catch wild cats, coyotes, rabbits, and other small animals. Grasshoppers were used to make a soup or crushed and made into a paste that was dried in the sunshine. The largest grasshoppers were often roasted on the end of a stick that was held over the hot coals of the fire. Then the grasshop grasshoppers were eaten right from the stick. Nyanuki and Sacagawea walked back to the camp with their woven reed baskets full of Kama's roots. My brother, come await, has been chosen to stand guard tonight for the first time. He will have to have much courage to stand alone in the dark, watching and listening for the enemy, said Sacagawea proudly. He is a strong and brave. I will sleep well knowing Kemowait is out there while we rest, said Nyanuki. Soon the smell of roasting Kamas root filled the air near the campsite. Kamas root was, are much like potatoes and are delicious when roasted. On this night there would be no meat, just Kamas roots, some seeds, and berries. In a few days fires would no longer be allowed for fear that the enemy would see the smoke and discover the tribe. All food would be eaten cold. The children loved to sit close to the warm fire as darkness brought on the chill of the mountain night. They were always eager to listen to the stories told by the brave warriors and hunters. There were stories of great hunts when many buffalo were killed, when everyone had plenty to eat, and when even women and children had moccasins made of buffalo hide. The children liked stories of big battles, in the old way of fighting. Enemy warriors lined up facing each other and stood in one place, ducking behind raw hide shields and shooting arrows at each other from a distance. They would fight all day with few warriors getting hurt. They never charged or got very close. One day the Shoshone warriors lined up to fight. The enemy warriors holding guns they had gotten from the white man hid behind their shields. When these deadly fire sticks exploded, they sent iron balls into the Shoshone Braves. The helpless Shoshones were mowed down as fast as the enemy could reload and fire. Terrified by this new magic, the survivors ran for their lives. Other stories told of how the Shoshones traded with the friendly Ute tribes for horses. With the horse of the, Sh the Shoshone warrior and hunter could ride as swiftly as the deer. With horses, the Shoshone could ride out onto the prairie to hunt and never be caught by the enemy. There were only a few stories around the campfire on this night. All the stories were about great buffalo hunts of the past. After the stories, a special buffalo dance was held to help please the spirits on the hunt. The main fire out in the large, 
open level area was built up to a bright blaze. A brave covered with a hairy buffalo robe and wearing a real looking buffalo headdress danced around the fire to the loud beat of the drums. Around and around he went in and out of the fire's edge he danced, faster and faster. Up and down he threw his head, with the horns coming very close to the crowd first, and then almost reaching into the fire as the dancer moved in and out and around and around. Then came ten dancing hunters, carrying spears, knives, and bows and arrows. They danced in a large circular circle far from the fire at first. The glow of the brightly burning fire cast flickering light and shadows on the warriors. It was a thrill for Nyanuki and Sacagawea and all of all the children to see this magnificent dance. They tapped their feet and clapped their hands to the beat of the drums. Now the buffalo dancer began dancing faster and faster as the drummers picked up the tempo. The hunters began to go faster around the cir large circle. As they did, they began to close in their circle slowly around the lone buffalo dancer. Excitement grew. Nyanuki could feel her heart beating as they danced near its end. In her imagination, she could see a real hunt with the braves riding in for the kill. Now the hunters closed their circle around the one in the buffalo costume. It seemed as though they would knock him into the flames. When the drummer's beat reached its fastest tempo, one of the hunters raised his spear and lunged at the buffalo dancer. He purposefully missed the buffalo dancer by only inches. The buffalo dancer fell to the ground, thrashing about wildly. More lunges with spears followed. Each spear hit inches from the fallen dancer. Then the buffalo dancer lay still, and the drum stopped. All was silent for a moment. The hunter making the kill uttered a shill, shrill cry that pierced the silence of the night. Instantly, the drummers resumed a slow, steady beat, and the fallen figure in the buffalo costume was carried off by the hunters. This dance was done to please the spirits and to bring good luck in the real buffalo hunt. This dance was short. Sometimes dances would last far into the night. Tonight the campfires would be covered early and the camp kept dark for protection. From now on there would be no more fires and no more dancing until the people returned safely from the prairie. And that will do it for chapter one of Nyanuki, the Shoshone girl who ran. Now make sure that you answer those questions with complete sentences and restate the question. If you're not sure of the answer, Go back and re-listen to the story. All right, guys, have a great rest of your day. We'll see you tomorrow for chapter two.